The Theory of Need and Marx by Agnes Heller. This is chapter five. The System of Needs and the Society of Associated Producers. Marx's analysis of the Society of Associated Producers is philosophically founded upon the concept of the system of needs. From the philosophical point of view, individual concrete needs cannot be analyzed in isolation since neither isolated needs nor isolated types of need exist. Every society has its own characteristic system of needs, which is therefore in no way valid for judging the system of needs of another society. Is the entire system of needs founded on estimation or on the whole organization of production? Most often needs arise directly from production or from a state of affairs based on production. Here I shall briefly summarize Marx's description of the dominant system of needs in capitalism. I have already spoken of it in the second chapter. The structure of needs is reduced to the need for possession, which subordinates the entire system to itself. All this is manifested in the members of the ruling class as the need quantitatively to increase needs Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that was right. All this is manifested in the members of the ruling class as the need quantitatively to increase needs of a single quality and the objects with which to satisfy these needs. Whilst in the working class, it is manifested as the reduction to simple needs of existence, that is, to natural needs and to their satisfaction. Qualitative needs are quantified. Needs as ends are turned into needs as means, and vice versa. Since needs of heterogeneous qualities cannot develop, men's pleasures remain crude and brutal, and some of their needs become fixed. Relations of interest dominate relationships between human beings. Production, the relations of production, social relations, and systems of need are, as we know, different aspects of a single formation, in which each is the precondition of the other. The structure of needs is an organic structure inherent in the total social formation. The structure of needs in capitalist society belongs, therefore, exclusively to capitalist society. It cannot be used to judge any other society in general, and least of all, that of the associated producers since the latter is the opposite not only of capitalist society, but of every civilized society that has existed to date. It is the first non-alienated society, the realm of freedom. But if a system of needs is specific to a given social formation, how can the subjective forces arise which are to overturn this given society? Every civilized society is a class society founded upon the division of labor in which there is also a division in the system of needs. The exploited classes generally ask for no more than a better satisfaction of the needs assigned to them. However, these same exploited masses become conscious, in various different historical conditions, of the existing opposition between their needs and those of the dominant classes. In this case, they seek to get rid of everything that stands in the way of the satisfaction of their needs, and to make their own system of needs general, as well as to make certain aspects of the ruling class's system of needs realizable for themselves. This leads either to the overturning of the social order or to the general ruin of the productive forces. In the first event, a new ruling class organizes itself, and the way in which the bourgeois state arose is the classic example of this. In the second case, society is unable to function in the passage cited from the Grand Reefs, Marx interprets the fall of the Roman Empire in this latter sense. Needs that transcend the present in this sense, however, are not radical needs. This is because need does not transcend the system of needs as a whole, but only the division of it. The need of the slave to be a free man is not a new need, because the society that enslaves him is a society of free men. The bourgeoisie's need to take political power is likewise not a new need. 
It is simply a demand for the satisfaction of a need which is already available to others and for the elimination of the obstacles to this satisfaction. The radical needs of the working class created by capitalism are, however, different by definition. Their nature is such that they cannot previously have been satisfied in the given society, either by the bourgeoisie or by the proletariat. The being of the bourgeoisie is just as alienated as that of the proletariat. Therefore, it is exclusively the radical needs which lead to the complete restructuring of the system of needs. On this, Marx has no doubts whatsoever. The system of needs under capitalism belongs to capitalism, but it is precisely this pure society which, by developing the productive forces sufficiently to overcome the division of labor, can and does create needs that belong to its being, but do not belong to its system of needs. Thus, only the radical needs enable man, in the interests of satisfying them, to bring about a social formation which is radically, from the root, different from the previous one. A society in which the radically new system of needs will be different from, from all earlier ones. It is therefore absurd to try to use the current existing structure of needs as a basis for judging the system of needs, which is Marx's precondition for the society of associated producers. Without the concept of restructuring the system of needs, the assertion that labor and surplus value will become a vital need is simply incomprehensible. For Marx, for Marx, the complete restructuring of the system of needs in communism is the sine qua non for any assertion about the future society. One can already read in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 that even the senses of socialized human beings will be different from what they are now. In the Grand Race, Marx writes uh, about the development of the wealth of human life and free time. Free time, which is both idle time and time for higher activity, has naturally transformed its possessor into a different subject. The stimulus for Marx to discuss this problem more deeply arises from the question of natural and luxury needs, that is the question of overcoming the opposition between them. These questions about the system of needs, at what point is this to be dealt with? Marx regards the radical restructuring of needs, capacities, and senses as natural. But since the society of associated producers also represents a totality, a social formation just as every other society does, the foundations of its operative mechanism and of the radically new structure of needs are interdependent. The new system of needs therefore becomes comprehensible only in relation to the functioning of the new social body, just as the functioning of the new social, social formation as a whole is comprehensible only in relation to the new system of needs. The society of associated producers is thus the society in which radical needs come to be satisfied and around which a new structure of needs is built. It is therefore also a society in which radical philosophy and radical theory are realized and surmounted. This does not of course mean the unqualified surmounting of philosophy as such, but of the radical philosophy which must grip the masses in order to become a material force. This will become clearer later on. The system of needs in communism must be dealt with from two distinct aspects, from that of material and non-material needs, and from that of the relation between these two types within a single structure of needs. By, by material needs, I mean needs whose objects and means of satisfaction used in consumption and in productive consumption must be produced and continually reproduced. Needs of a non-material character are, in contrast, those whose objects of satisfaction are not produced in the organic interchange with nature or not produced at all. I know that this is not a pure distinction to satisfy the need for art. Production is to some extent necessary. Houses must be built, books, is mu books must be printed, but the need for art as such is not satisfied either by the house or by the book, but by the work of art, which is an objectivation which 
as an objectivation does not belong to the sphere of production. The distinction, the distinction between these two aspects is not arbitrary. It is based on an essential distinction which Marx applied. In his view, the sphere of production is the field which will always remain, the realm of necessity. Above it is the realm of freedom, which subordinates production to its own ends. Needs that can be satisfied only through institutions, this also applies to social and community satisfaction of needs, are partly of a material nature, since they absorb material means and partly not, since they are satisfied by human activity. Marx cites schools and hospitals as examples. The need for public institutions is partly of a material nature, for example, the construction of dwellings, and partly not, rendering services of a non-material nature. For Marx, at least in the second phase of communism, this is natural, since the opposition between productive and unproductive labor, which is constituted by capitalism, ceases to exist, since there is no longer either exchange or exchange value, labor power is not a commodity, etc. The category of socially necessary labor time will be in interpretable only in relation to the process of material production. The concept of socially necessary labor time is not applicable to any free activity, whether medicine, teaching, planning, or scientific and artistic activity. Certainly, all this does not hold true for the first phase of communism insofar as the division there is regulated on the basis of labor supplied, for which the socially necessary labor time must obviously be measured in every activity involving labor. On this point, Marx does not give any detailed analysis, limiting himself simply to the observation that in this phase, the system of equal rights for unequal individuals prevails, i.e. the legal system of bourgeois society. We cannot imagine this mechanism without commodity and money relations. In the well-known 10th paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, which describes the measures necessary for laying the basis for the first phase of communism, there is no hint of the overcoming of commodity production. Marx and Engels speak only of measures which appear economically insufficient and untenable, but which, in the course of the movement, outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order, and are unavoidable as a means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production. In the, eye <clears throat> in the eyes of Marx and Engels, um, this tr transition appears as inevitable, and they do not take the actual problems into consideration. Likewise, it is unclear whether the realization of the first phase of communism also brings with it the overcoming of commodity production, or whether this will be characteristic of the second phase. Marx and Engels rarely deal with the how of the transition. They limit themselves to the comparison of the ideal types. Since we are analyzing Marx's theory of need, we too can work only with these ideal types. We are therefore forced to exclude a problem which is crucial for us today, namely the problem of transition which of course can last for centuries. And to refrain from analyzing his model of transition, or rather his possible models, it is necessary also to make another limitation. Given that we are analyzing Marx's theory of needs, we shall consider the model of associated producers only from this latter point of view, and leave the other aspects aside, important as they may be. To be able to analyze the relationship of need to material production and its products, we must also find out exactly what role is played by material production in Marx's idea of the society of associated producers. We need to examine the following aspects. A. Is production developed? B. To what extent does the development of production represent the growth of social wealth? C. Is there a division of labor? D. Do necessary and surplus labor exist or not? E. What are the proportions between the production of direct consumer goods and means of production on the one hand, and the production of those goods which are essential for the social satisfaction of needs on the other hand? To the first question, Marx's reply is an unequivocal yes. 
The society of the future is also a society of material wealth, which continues to grow. This idea is encountered in virtually all of Marx's works. I shall cite just one example as proof. In the third volume of Theories of Surplus Value, he describes the two alternatives for increasing disposable time. One alternative would be to produce greater wealth in half the current average labor time. The other would be to reduce the labor time by half in such a way as to direct the remaining half towards the satisfaction of necessary needs as they are at present. Marx considers it a theoretical mistake a lack of clarity to confuse these two alternatives. He explicitly declares himself to be in favor of the first of them. The base for the future development of production will be the extraordinary growth in the proportion of fixed capital, which is quite possible because the increase in production will be independent of the valorization of capital. The increase in the proportion of fixed capital to levels that are impossible under capitalism is the guarantee that material production will require ever less living labor. This is the only way to reduce labor time uninterruptedly while maintaining a constant increase in production. This does not of course mean that dead labor will dominate living labor because the capital relation no longer exists. On the contrary, living labor will prevail over dead. base for the future development oh sorry that's the same paragraph the idea of unlimited progress in material production is a clear characteristic of marx's thought his ideas on the rate of increase of production are however contradictory on more than one occasion on the one hand he assumes that capitalism arrives at a point where the development of the forces of production and in particular the increase in fixed capital ceases and that therefore the rate of material production in the society of associated producers would have to be more rapid, at least in comparison with the situation in latter-day capitalism. On the other hand, the increased rate of material production, which we shall have more to say about later, is determined by the needs of the associated producers. However, in parallel with growing wealth, these needs will be less and less directed towards material consumer goods. This already suggests a new structure of needs which is of decisive importance. In the new structure of needs, Marx uses a sort of saturation model. Material consumer goods, those which serve immediate consumption, will play an increasingly limited role in the structure of needs of individuals, or at any rate, their proportion would be less. They would be limited by other needs, not by production itself since production does not overtake needs but is directed towards them. On the basis of the model indicated, it is in fact inconceivable that any new material needs could arise from production itself, i.e. that new types of needs could be produced. All this should indicate a fall-off in the rate of increase of production, at least after a certain level of wealth is attained. Marx believed that he could already see this structural change in the radical needs of the proletariat of his day. This can also be seen from his comments on the theses of the proletarian ideologist Galliani. The latter's basic thesis was, as we know, that true wealth is man. Marx supported this view and added, the whole objective world, the world of goods, vanishes here as a mere aspect of socially producing men. And so we come to the second problem. To what extent does the development of production represent the growth of social wealth? We can extract two quite distinct problems from this question, though they usually appear together. One, to what extent can labor be considered the source of material wealth? Two, to what extent can production, including the material wealth, which is realized in production, be considered the sole source of wealth in general? It should be pointed out that Marx regards the two questions as completely separable in principle, mainly because the source of use values, wealth, um, wealth in use values being actual material wealth, is labor in nature, not labor alone. A radical analysis of this problem can be found in the critique of the Gotha program and elsewhere. 
1. Marx gives different answers to the first question, which we shall consider in due course. It is bourgeois society which considers labor to be the only source of material wealth, a society dominated by the contradiction between use value and exchange value, which is embodied in commodity production. In theories of surplus value, Marx accuses some of Ricardo's critics of remaining within the system of categories of bourgeois society, in that they still consider labor the sole source of wealth, even when they draw conclusions from this which are opposed to those of Ricardo. Still more important, however, is the fact that according to Marx's conception of labor, the labor performed in production in the society of associated producers decreases to a minimum and even ceases to exist. It becomes, therefore, absurd to see labor as the source of material wealth, or to apply the criterion of labor time to material wealth. In developing this position, Marx adopts, albeit with some reservations, the reasoning of the author of the booklet Source and Remedy. This does not alter the fact that it is also his own position. I would, however, stress that this is only one of Marx's conceptions, which demonstrates all the more that in his eyes, the statements, labor is the source of material wealth and production is the source of material wealth, are different and clearly distinguishable from each other. In this connection, I would like also to quote from the Grand Race. Labor no longer appears so much to be included within the production process. Rather, the human being comes to relate more as watchman and regulator to the production process itself. No longer does the worker insert a modified natural thing as middle link between the object and himself. Rather, he inserts the process of nature transformed into an industrial process as a means between himself and inorganic nature, mastering it. He steps to the side of the production process instead of being its chief actor. In this transformation, it is neither the direct human labor he himself performs, nor the time during which he works, but rather the appropriation of his own general productive power. His understanding of nature and his mastery over it by virtue of his presence as a social body, it is, in a word, the development of the social individual, which appears as the great foundation stone of production and of wealth. As soon as labor in the direct form has ceased to be the great wellspring of wealth, labor time ceases and must cease to be its measure, and hence exchange value must cease to be the measure of use value. Let us disregard for the moment the fact that Marx identifies value with exchange value here, concepts which he rigorously separates in capital, where he is using a different conception of labor, in which the measure of labor time necessarily plays a part. We shall analyze this passage only for our own purposes. The Society of Associated Producers appears in this quotation as a society in which labor is carried out by, by machines, in which fixed capital therefore completely predominates and in which, at least in the process of material production, labor power is employed only as watchman and regulator. To use a modern expression, Marx presupposes complete automation in this way, a specific type of labor acquires an extraordinary importance, namely scientific labor, or as Marx calls it, or as Marx calls it, labor in general. Scientific labor is not, however, immediately productive labor, but the activity of the general intellect, planning, projection, and so forth. Um, this cannot, however, be measured in labor time since the concept of socially necessary labor time is not applicable. In short, material wealth is still supplied by production, but no longer by product productive labor in the conventional sense of the term. This determines the hegemony of intellectual labor over so-called physical labor. 2. The other question is whether production is the source of wealth in society. Marx replies everywhere and unequivocally, no. The material wealth which comes about through production is not and cannot be anything but a condition of the general wealth of society. The true wealth of society is realized through the free self-activity of social individuals and through their qualitatively many-sided system of needs. 
The true wealth of man in society consists not in labor time, but in free time. For this very reason, the wealth of the society of associated producers cannot be measured by labor time, but only by free time. I shall here refer not to the well-known passages in the Grand Rees, but to the third volume of theories of surplus value. Labor time, even if exchange value is eliminated, always remains the creative substance of wealth and the measure of the cost of its production. But free time, disposable time, is wealth itself, partly for the enjoyment of the product, partly for the free activity which, unlike labor, is not dominated by the pressure of an extraneous purpose which must be fulfilled, and the fulfillment of which is regarded as a natural necessity or social duty according to one's inclination. This passage presupposes the distinction between exchange value and value. Both, one and two, different as they are, are solutions which presuppose a change in the structure of needs, so that individuals feel the need for more free time and for free activity in it, rather than for a further increase in the production of goods and material wealth. There is in fact no level of production which is so high that one cannot, at the expense of free time, produce still more. In both conceptions, you find the conviction at its most profound, that needs in the society of associated producers have limits set to them by, by other qualitatively different needs. We shall come back again to the part played by the general labor in these models, as well as to the problem of the need for free time. Um, the relationship between material production and the structure of needs in the society of associated producers is purely a function of the existence or non-existence of the division of labor, and if it does exist, of its nature. One, without doubt, the social division of labor will cease, and with it the, div the division of society into exploiters and exploited. In a word, the class structure. The dividing out which takes place in the system of needs according to the position occupied in the social division of labor will also cease. The individual will no longer be subordinated to the social division of labor. Thus, if a division of labor continues to exist in another sense of the term, the individual will, however, be able to choose freely the position he wishes to occupy and will always be able to renew his choice. In principle, this is also the case in capitalism, but in fact, it has never been so. The social division of labor subordinates man to itself, and in practice, people cannot choose any work except that which they have to perform. Um, hold on. The continual change of work under capitalism is not the consequence of the worker's free choice or of his needs for development, but is subordinated to the need to valorize capital. If we suppose that in the society of associated producers, there needs to be at least some kind of division of labor, then the entry into this division and the changes of work will depend only on the worker's needs for development. Two, the division between manual and intellectual labor will clearly be overcome. Marx had two different conceptions of how this might come about. We have already mentioned one of these. Production and labor are separated. Man, <coughs> man, man sets himself alongside the process of production. Every activity of the worker, including those which are socially necessary, becomes labor of an intellectual type. The other conception that Marx introduces is essentially different. On the basis of it, as we shall see later on, every type of productive labor comes to be, comes to be reduced to simple labor. However, here too labor time must be reduced so that human life can be engaged for the most part in intellectual activity. But intellectual activity is also, at least in part, labor. It involves fatigue and uses the brain, nerves, strength, muscle, particularly the first two. In both types of labor, the opposition between work and labor disappears. 
This opposition reaches its culminating point in capitalism and is characteristic of class society. In the labor that is performed in socially necessary labor time, work guides labor. Recall the last phrase in the passage quoted from theories of surplus value. Labor will always be subjected to external ends, but in contradistinction to what happens in capitalism, men will perform it as social duty. But this distinction will finally disappear in the labor of free activity. Work becomes pure labor. If, however, labor in this latter sense and physical labor, the two things are distinct and both of Marx's conceptions are given and indeed this labor is a constant in both concept conceptions, then they will be performed by all. And so every person will have time, equal amounts of time for free activity. According to the first conception, the very nature of labor will do away with the distinction between manual and intellectual labor. According to the other, this will not be the case. As far as individuals are concerned, however, Marx's thinking is coherent and unambiguous. Every human being will take part in the process of interaction between nature and society. In other words, as long as manual labor exists, it will be performed. If it does not exist, the functioning of fixed capital will be regulated. But every human being will perform highly developed, purely intellectual labor. This is the essence of the young Marx's extraordinarily perceptive remark that under communism, the human being will be fisherman, hunter, shepherd, and critical critic, and that there will be no such people as painters, but simply those who, among other things, paint. So according to Marx's view of the future, there will, there will in effect, be no specialized workers involved in purely intellectual or purely manual activities. This does not mean, however, that there will be no specialized intellectual activity in productive labor or in the control of production. It simply means that the specialized activity performed in production does not determine the direction of a person's intellectual activity during their free time and that it does not determine their chosen form of self-realization. And it does not negate the principle that anyone may give priority to any particular form of activity during their free time. It simply means that they must participate in labor, in the performance of socially necessary labor, and in the regulation and control of production. Real theoretical problems arise, however, for Marx, does not discuss the question of whether one has to produce in order to perform free time activities. According to the conception of the measurement of needs, which we shall deal with later, material consumption, direct and productive consumption, requires material production, but nothing is said about free activity. This explains why it is so easy for Marx to measure material needs and to calculate their average. Three. We have, examined, we have examined the way in which various forms of the division of labor are overcome, but this does not explain how every division of labor is overcome. Marx quite clearly says that there will be a technical division of labor, though only one in the society of associated producers. One reads in Capital, for example, that the, that the whole of social production will function as a single factory with the division of social labor corresponding to the technical division of labor in a factory. In the third volume of Theories of Surplus Value, he specifically raises the question of whether the concentration of capital and the continued growth of fixed capital, which makes the technical division of labor necessary, do not also entail a necessity for capitalist relations of production and a social division of labor. And in this context, Marx attacks those theoreticians who tie the specialization which arises from centralization to capitalist relations of production, as if the division of labor were not likewise possible if its conditions belong to the associated workers and were regarded by the latter as their own products and the material elements of their own activity, which they are by their very nature. 
What the bourgeois economists want to achieve with this identification is the technological justification for the specific special for the specific social form, i.e. the capitalist form, in which the relationship of labor to the conditions of labor is turned upside down, so that it is not the worker who makes use of the conditions of labor, labor but the conditions of labor which make use of the worker. What does the presence of the technical division of labor mean for human labor? How can it guarantee the universality of mankind? Is individual specialization possible within it? Marx's only consistent reply to these questions is in capital. Other solutions appear only in the form of aphorisms. When he says that man will be at one and the same time fisherman, hunter, shepherd, and critical critic, Marx has in mind a Goethean universality, even if he does not mean that man can be a dilettante in everything. He means rather that man can excel in many kinds of activity, which are basically different as regards their quality. In Capital, on the other hand, he means that all labor will be reduced to a simple labor, which is easy to learn and to perform. The perspective of universality in this case does not mean, at least where the labor process is concerned, that people may excel in various fields, but they but that they can always change their work without having specific qualifications in the grand Rice. The activity of man who appears alongside the process of production is complex and calls for qualification. However, Marx does not go deeply into this conception. The important thing for us is that he does not apply it to the analysis of the relationship between productive, labor, and material needs. Clearly, therefore, the structure of needs sketched in the model in the Grand Rice cannot be, cannot be the same as that in Capital. Since I am analyzing only the explicit positions that Marx takes, it is necessary to keep to the arguments concerning this problem in Capital. The validity of the categories of necessary labor and surplus labor in the society of associated producers and the interpretation of the category of socially necessary labor are crucially dependent on the question of whether Marx identifies value and exchange value or whether he differentiates between them. Up to and including a contribution to the critique of political economy, he tends to regard them as synonymous, but later he works with two concepts of value. The first keeps the earlier meaning. Value is realized exclusively in the exchange relation. See Capital Volume 1, page 60. According to the other interpretation, value is a general social category, at least in a, in a rational economy. The law of value is a general economic law, which, as we have seen, can find an adequate expression only in the society of associated producers. Remember the arguments in the first volume of Capital, with which Marx demonstrates that the mystical form of the commodity cannot have originated either from use value or from value. In this connection, a passage from the critique of the Gotha program of 1875 is also relevant. In it, Marx speaks of how and when distribution according to needs can be realized. He explicitly says that value exists only in the first phase of communism, where goods cannot yet be distributed according to needs. Where there is value, distribution. <coughs> Distribution takes place according to labor. The first phase of communism is thus still marked by the equality of exchange. Equal labor is exchanged for equal labor. Labor must still be measured on the basis of labor time. Quantitatively and qualitatively equal labor times are exchanged. However, within the cooperative society based on common ownership of the means of production, the producers do not exchange their products any more than labor employed on the products appears as the value of them. One might, of course, interpret this as meaning that values ceases to exist, that value ceases to exist only in the first meaning of the concept. But this is contradicted by the fact that, in Marx's view, in the second phase of communism, labor becomes a vital need. We are face to face here with a return to the ideas of the Grand Rees. In the critique of the Gothic program, as in the Grand Rees, 
Marx outlines a welfare society in which labor becomes a vital need. There's a difference here from theories of surplus value, where, as in capital, labor appears in most instances as social duty, something completely different from a vital need. In the model which is outlined in capital and in theories of surplus value, production for needs is not correlated with labor as a vital need, but with labor as social duty. The theory of the pure dominance of the law of value necessarily follows upon this. Although there is no reference to it in the critique of the Gotha program, it is probable that when Marx was writing about labor in this work, he had in mind a similar model to that in the Grand Reis. In fact, while it is difficult to envisage simple, unskilled mechanical labor as a vital need, it is easy enough to envisage the skilled labor of control as a vital need. controlled by the human being who appears alongside the process of production. Even more so if we bear it in mind that when Marx is talking of the reduction of labor to simple labor, he never speaks of the transformation of labor into a vital need, but stresses that labor always remains the realm of necessity and that the realm of freedom begins outside it in free time. Um, where am I? We shall turn now to the categories of necessary labor, surplus labor, and socially necessary labor. Let us start with the Grand Reis. The labor time necessary for production has an important role to play, especially if we bear in mind that it must diminish as far as possible and to an ever increasing degree. It cannot function as a measure since all labor will be qualitatively different. And what is more qualitatively different according to the individual and therefore unquantifiable. The idea of reduction to simple labor does not appear. Economy of time to this all economy ultimately reduces itself. Society likewise has to distribute its time in a purposeful way in order to achieve a production adequate to its overall needs. Thus economy of time along with the planned distribution of labor time among the various branches of production remains the first economic law on the basis of communal production. It becomes a law there to an even higher degree. However, this is essentially different from a measurement of exchange values, labor or products, by labor time. The labor of individuals in the same branch of work and the various kinds of work are different from one another, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. What does a sole quantitative difference between things presuppose? The, identi the identity of their qualities, hence the quantitative measure of labors presupposes the equivalence, the identity of their quality. It is no accident that he fails to mention the reduction to simple labor. As long as different kinds of labor are divided into simple and complex, this reduction is performed by the market. As is well known, this kind of problem does not arise in capital. It is possible to measure by means of labor time with or without a market, because all labor is simple labor. If, however, as one finds in the Grand Reis and also in the critique of the Gotha program, the labor envisaged for the future is qualitatively different not only for the various branches of industry, but also for the individuals, then the socially necessary labor time can no longer serve as a measure. We can add a particularly striking example in relation to science. How can the socially necessary labor time be fixed in the sphere of science? How can qualitatively different types of scientific activity be compared on this basis? In Capital II, in capital two a role of prime importance in the society of associated producers is attributed to science. But in this case, the reduction to simple labor becomes invalid, though Marx is not aware of this. In this respect, the arguments in the Grand Reis are of greater importance. In the passage quoted above, material production in the future appears in Marx's view to be fully rationalized. But at the same time, no criterion or measure of this rationalization is given. Its vehicle is simply the general intellect or the capacity for rationalization which the Society of Associated Producers possesses. 
It is unnecessary to stress once again that the idea of labor as a vital need is inherent in this conception. In the Grand Race, there is one single concept of necessary labor, that of socially necessary labor, the division of the labor of an individual person into necessary and surplus labor ceases at the same time as capitalism. In this case, it no longer makes sense to divide the labor time during which a man works to satisfy his necessary needs from the rest of his labor time, given that this latter part is likewise performed by the social individual for himself and not for the valorization of capital. Since every item produced directly or indirectly satisfies the needs of the socialized individual, so too, from the point of view of the individual, labor is no longer divided into necessary and surplus labor. Proudhon's lack of understanding of this matter is evident from his axiom that every labor leaves a surplus. What he denies for capital he transforms into a natural property of labor. The point is rather that the labor time necessary to meet absolute needs leaves free time, and that therefore a surplus product can be created if surplus labor is worked. The aim is to suspend the relation itself, so that the surplus product itself appears as necessary. One gets the impression, however, that in the Grand Rees, Marx is already distinguishing the first phase of communism from the second, though not so explicitly as in the critique of the Gotha program. It is absolutely clear from the latter work that in the first phase of communism, it is indeed possible to make a real distinction between necessary and surplus labor. From the so-called gross yield of labor, society deducts the labor time necessary to invest in means of production, as well as the labor time which is devoted to production for the communal satisfaction of needs and for social purposes. The worker receives, in the form of wages, what he can use for the satisfaction of his personal needs. His necessary labor is also embodied in this. Man, in fact, works according to his capacities, but work has not yet become a vital need for him, and true social wealth does not yet exist, and so it is necessary to keep necessary labor separate. However true it may be that in the last analysis, all labor performed is necessary, socially necessary labor. Whenever in the grand race the notion of wages in the future society appears, with a positive emphasis, and the emphasis is only positive when the reference is to future society, one is confronted with a prospect for the future society which Marx regarded as an immediate possibility. Marx writes that the historic destiny of capital is fulfilled as soon as there has been such a development of needs, that surplus labor above and beyond necessity has itself become a general need arising out of individual needs themselves. Hence where labor in which a human being does that does what a thing could do has ceased. Here Marx skips the first phase of communism, but this is an exceptional case. There can be no doubt that Marx is presupposing the existence of wages and therefore the distinction from the individual's point of view between necessary and surplus labor, as well as the functioning of the law of value. Marx introduces another conception too, obviously for a more distant future that from the point of view of the individual, there will be no distinction between necessary labor and surplus labor, and that the law of value will also have lost its function. <clears throat> as soon as labor in the direct form has ceased to be the great wellspring of wealth, labor time ceases and must cease to be its measure, and hence exchange value must cease to be the measure of use value. As we have said, the categories of value and exchange value are not differentiated here. With that, production based on exchange value breaks down and the direct material production process is stripped of the form of penury and antithesis, a further example of how the contradiction is solved. The free development of individualities, and hence not the reduction of necessary labor time, so as to posit surplus labor but rather the general reduction of the necessary labor of society to a minimum, which then corresponds to the artistic, scientific, etc. development of the individuals in the time set free and with the means created for all of them. This conception, 
which in the Grundrisse and the Critique of the Gotha Program characterizes only the first phrase of communism, becomes dominant in Marx's exposition. Once value and exchange value have been distinguished, the rationality of labor must be measured by the socially necessary labor time. The possibility is also posed, though not in such a radical and basic way, of rationally separating necessary labor from surplus labor in the society of associated producers itself. In theories of surplus value, Marx writes, Let us suppose, however, that the capital does not exist, but that the worker himself appropriates his own surplus labor. That is to say, he appropriates the excess of the values that he has created over the excess of the values that he has consumed. It is only of this labor that one could speak as truly productive, that is to say, labor that creates new values. In the first volume of Capital, the problem is discussed in detail. Before quoting this passage, I would like to emphasize that Marx also leaves other alternatives open, which he associates with the changeover to the communist mode of production and distribution. But from our point of view, what is interesting is that he speaks before all else of a possibility of distinguishing between necessary and surplus labor. Let us now picture to ourselves, by way of change, a community of free individuals carrying on their work with the means of production in common, in which the labor power of all the different individuals is consciously applied as the combined labor power of the community. The total product of our community is a social product. One portion serves as fresh means of production and remains social, but another portion is consumed by the members as means of subsistence. A distribution of this portion amongst them is consequently necessary. The mode of this distribution will vary with the productive organization of community and the degree of historical development attained by the producers. We will assume, but merely for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. Labor time would, in that case, play a double part. It's, its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan maintains proper the proportion between the different kinds of work to be done and the various wants of the community. On the other hand, it also serves as a measure of the portion of the, com of the common labor borne by each individual and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers with regard both to their labor and to its products are in this case perfectly simple and intelligible, and that with regard not only to production, but also to distribution. There can be no doubt that this conception, at least where it concerns the second function of the measure of labor time, corresponds exactly to the model which is defined in the critique of the Gotha program as the first phase of communism and which still bears the birthmarks of capitalist society. In the second and even more in the third volume of Capital, there is no distinction between necessary and surplus labor as regards the individual human being, the individual producer, but the distinction, uh, the individual producer, but the distinction is maintained with reference to the social product as a whole i.e. with reference to the society of associated producers considered as one huge individual. The characteristic of capitalist society is not in fact surplus labor, but its transformation into capital. That this takes place in the shape of a transformation of profit into capital signifies merely that it is the capitalist rather than the laborer who disposes of excess labor. In the same work he says, it is only where production is under the actual predetermining control of society that the latter establishes a relation between the volume of social labor, time, applied in producing definite articles, and the volume of the social want to be satisfied by these articles. That is, the associated producers first measure the existing disposable labor time. This depends on the size of the population and on the question of disposable hours of labor time. So much the better if this is small, the more developed the productive forces, the smaller the number of hours of labor time marked down for productive purposes. This labor time is then subdivided between the various branches of production in the following way. A, the socially necessary labor time in each branch of production is measured, rationally determined, 
B. It is decided how much of this time should be used to satisfy the population's immediate needs for material goods. This is the necessary labor, and how much is available for other purposes, e.g. for the development of means of production. This is the surplus labor. It should be stressed that this conception is clearly based upon the reduction of labor to simple labor, and therefore upon the hypothesis that the labor performed by each individual, presupposing that the level of productivity is the same, can be performed in an approximately equal time, and also that it is performed as a matter of duty. In the case of complex labor, which Marx considers in the Grand Race, this kind of rationality can be introduced only by calculating separately the value of an hour's labor from each individual, which would be absurd without the existence of a market. One may recall that it is precisely for this reason that in the Grand Race, measurement by means of labor time is dropped. I repeat, measurement in terms of labor time and the distinction between necessary and surplus labor without a market structure is based essentially upon the whole of society being conceived as one single individual. We still have to consider what the almost unsolvable problems are that arise here regarding the relation between production and needs. Without doubt, Marx imagines the society of associated producers as one in which the measurement of wealth is not the proportion of necessary labor to surplus labor, but the proportion of necessary time to disposable time. It does not matter here whether Marx does or does not differentiate between necessary and surplus labor. Naturally, the development of productive, the development of productive forces is a precondition for the increase in disposable time. But true wealth for human beings is realized in the free types of activity in disposable time. The free types of self-activity in disposable times. The idea is, in itself, clear and non-contradictory. The problems only arise when we examine the relation between disposable time and production or consumption. Disposable time is time for consumption, not for labor. It is time on the one hand, for enjoyment derived from the use of material goods, and on the other hand, for free intellectual activities which, to the extent that they require ready-produced means, belong likewise to the sphere of consumption, which could also be called creative consumption. We are not taking into consideration here those purely intellectual needs which are satisfied during disposable time. The problem arises of whether those activities which Marx places in the category of consumption, but which are indispensable conditions in moments of production, are performed in necessary or in disposable time. For example, the social satisfaction of needs, e.g. training, and the control of production belong to this group. It seems natural that they should be performed during necessary time. The conception set out in the Grand Race is consistently in line with this and this interpretation. Since labor of the old type no longer exists, production is controlled by a qualitatively different type of activity. And since the necessary labor is not measured in labor time, every type of activity played a role in production is a constituent part of this necessary time. If, however, we look at the third volume of Capital, we shall find that the answer is not so easy. According to the conception outlined there, necessary time consists in the performance of simple labor. For Marx, training and the control of production cannot be considered as simple labor, and so they cannot belong to the system of exchange of simple labor. One may, of course, suppose that individuals perform the tasks of control and direction over and above their necessary labor, and that their free self-activity lies in precisely this. If this were so, however, it would, be, it would mean that one particular socially necessary labor would be an organic part of disposable time and cannot be included in socially necessary labor time. We can certainly imagine the exchange of labors within necessary time. However, it would not be an exchange between simple kinds of labor, but between simple and complex labor. And where do people develop the capacities which qualify them for the work of control? If we reply in necessary time, then the theory of simple labor collapses completely. For in the process of exchanging labors, everyone for the time being is doing the controlling and everyone has to master the performance of complex labor processes. 
In this way, the proportion of necessary time allocated for actual productive labor would be extraordinarily reduced. If this mastery of complex labor processes is developed during a disposable time, we are back again with our previous contradiction. In fact, it makes no difference one way or the other whether, during their free time, people perform a simple labor or train themselves for complex labor. In either event, a part of their free time is socially necessary and is not measurable in socially necessary labor time. The problem becomes even more striking if we consider the function of the natural sciences. Natural science, in Marx's view, is the greatest productive force. Scientific labor is labor in general. If the performance of scientific labor and the training needed for it belong to necessary time, as it obviously should, then specialization ensues. This contradicts the conception presented in Capital, not only in the sense that different people specialize in different branches of science, but also in the sense that certain people specialize in the natural science, sciences in general. These people perform complex labor, the others simple, the others simple labor. A kind of specialization in which everyone masters a particular branch of the natural sciences and practices it alternately with simple labor would likewise drastically reduce the time assigned to direct production. If instead training in a branch of the natural science, sciences belongs to the sphere of free activities during disposable time, then once again this cannot be measured by socially necessary labor time. Personally, I can imagine in the far distant future a model in which everyone is an expert in some field, but only with the aid of an allocation of disposable time, and only with a completely different determination of value from that which is presented in the third volume of Capital. Now we can discuss the interaction between production and the structure of needs in the society of, of associated producers. We've already noted that in, this, in his conception of the Society of Associated Producers, Marx is working with an altogether new structure of needs. The primary role here is played by the need for labor, by which the whole theory stands or falls, and as we have seen by the need for surplus labor. We know that the origin of the need for labor and its growth into a vital need are not synonymous for Marx. In capitalism, labor is a burden. A, because it is performed under external compulsion, because it is alienated, and B, because its specific nature offers no possibility of self-realization. He, Adam Smith, is right, of course, that in its historic forms as slave labor, serf labor, and wage labor, labor always appears as repulsive, always ex as external forced labor, and not labor, by contrast, as freedom and happiness. This holds doubly for this contradictory labor, and relatedly for labor which has not yet created the subjective and objective conditions for itself, in which labor becomes attractive work, the individual's self-realization, which in no way means that it becomes mere fun, mere amusement, as Fourier, with grisette-like naivete, conceives it. Marx uses the composition of music as an example of the kind of labor that is purely intellectual. In the Grundries, both conditions are satisfied. Alienation is overcome and labor becomes travail attract attractif. Since, with the production of material goods, labor in the traditional sense ceases, all labor becomes essentially intellectual labor, the field for the self-realization of the human personality. It thus becomes the vital need, a determining, even if not the most determining, human need, and hence it also assumes the dominant role in the structure of needs. In this conception, there, can, there never can arise any question about why human beings work. In the framework of capital, however, only one condition is satisfied. The alienation of labor ceases in every respect, but labor itself does not become travail attract attractif. Mm. That doesn't make sense. In this interpretation, labor in the society of associated producers is not free self-activity. In fact, the realm of freedom actually begins only where labor which is determined by necessity and mundane considerations cease. Thus, in the very nature of things, it lies beyond the sphere of actual material production. Freedom in this field can only consist in socialized man, the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, 
bringing it under their common control instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature and achieving this with the least expenditure of energy and under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature. But it nonetheless still remains a realm of necessity. Beyond it begins that development of human energy, which is an end in itself, the true realm of freedom, which however can blossom forth only with this realm of necessity as its basis. The shortening of the working day is its basic prerequisite. <clears throat> Three comments need to be made here. First, since according to the quotation from Capital, only free time is the sphere of free self-activity. Marx is attributing an even greater importance here than in the Grandries to time economy, to the reduction of the necessary working time, and to the rationalization of production. Secondly, since labor is not itself travail attractif, it may be asked why people work. Thirdly, I would like to emphasize that from this point of view, the project here appears just as utopian, despite the fact that its presentation is more realistic, as in the Grandries. I believe it conceivable that there should be such a huge abyss between the activity of labor and the activity of free time. I believe it inconceivable that there should be such a huge abyss between the activity of labor and the activity of free time. The Grand Reese's noble picture of the individual active in his free time who re-enters production, a changed man would lose its relevance. Production does not need to be performed by changed, richer human beings. This dissect this discussion could take us far away from our real argument, so let us return to the second question. Why do people work? Assuming the structure of needs to be what it is today, the answer can only be conceived in terms of the general obligation to labor. But the obligation to labor, for Marx, is characteristic only of a period of transition, the brief phase of the dictatorship of the proletariat. In the society of associated producers, only nature can force people to do, to do anything. No one can force anyone else. Feudal lordship and serfdom are, in Marx's view, reciprocal determinations. There is no feudal lordship without serfdom and vice versa. In the first phase of communism, in which people share products according to their labor, there is naturally a form of obligation inherited from capitalism. In order to live, people must work. But when they share their goods according to their needs and the labor time of each individual is not divided into necessary labor and surplus labor, then this form of obligation also ceases to exist. So why do human beings work? In Capital, Marx posits a structure of needs that is basically new, that transforms human beings into changed people, for whom social duty is not only an external, but an internal motivation. In this respect, must and ought now coincide. I can only imagine this model in a society composed of communities. We shall see below how this hypothesis occurred to Marx. Only in capital do we find a consistent conception of the interaction between material needs and production. It is only where production is under the actual predetermining control of society that the latter establishes the relation between the volume of social labor time applied in producing definite articles and the volume of the social want to be satisfied by these articles. And further on, secondly, after the abolition of the capitalist mode of production, but still retaining social production, the determination of value continues to prevail in the sense that the regulation of labor time and the distribution of social labor among the various production groups, ultimately, <clears throat> the bookkeeping encompassing all this becomes more central than ever. And again, <clears throat> Surplus labor in general, as labor performed over and above the given requirements, must always remain. A definite quantity of surplus labor is required as insurance against accidents, and by the necessary and progressive expansion of the process of reproduction, in keeping with the development of the needs and the growth of population, which is called accumulation from the viewpoint of the capitalist. What then, according to this point of view, is the relationship between material needs and production. Society produces for needs, hence the accidental character of the market is eliminated. It is therefore possible, according to Marx, to avoid the waste of material goods 
and productive capacities, which characterizes capitalism and stems from the fact that production and needs are brought together only on the market. How are needs and production matched? The association, or sorry, the associated producers, as I have already indicated, will measure A, needs, and B, their disposable labor time, and will fix C, the labor time socially necessary for each activity. They will then divide up and reallocate the productive forces between various branches of production. They will, of course, also take into account the production that does not directly serve the satisfaction of needs. The expansion of production, insurance funds, and they are not mentioned here, but they appear in other passages. Public investments that will satisfy needs only over a period of time. What are the needs which must be measured and for which production must be undertaken? They are the true social needs which are identified with necessary needs. But how can true social needs be measured? It is assumed that the needs of individuals that are direct, directly orienta oriented towards consumption are both qualitatively and quantitatively roughly equal. It is therefore extraordinarily easy to account for them. With the aid of random samples, both qualities and quantity can be determined. So far, so good, but human beings in communist society in Marx's view are characterized above all, all else by the fact that their needs considered individually and the needs of different individuals will, <clears throat> will be qualitatively and quantitatively extremely varied. If this is also true of material needs, the kind of measurement given in capital is simply absurd. Even if a procedure were invented, it would be indeed a complex one. To carry it out, one could assert with some certainty <laughs> that such a production for needs would lead to a waste of material goods and productive forces much greater than that to which the production of commodities, regulation by the market, has led or can lead. We would thus be saying that Marx did not apply the individualization of needs to the field of need for material goods. Only non-quantifiable types of need would become individual and qualitatively different. Quantifiable types of need, true material needs, would not become individual. This would lead to an extremely homogeneous and almost uniform image of the individual. If that is, one accepts that Marx regarded material needs as playing a decisive role in the structure of needs of individuals. But Marx actually thought exactly the opposite, that for individuals in the society of associated producers, material needs occupy a subordinate role in the structure of needs, so that the development of a system of individual needs becomes possible notwithstanding their qualitative and quantitative equality. This conception is based upon relatively static needs, which develop very slowly, at least where material needs are concerned. It does not even take into consideration the fact that, as we have said, purely qualitative needs, which are eo ipso individual, also call for material production and that this raises further difficulties in calculating them. So repetitive. In this conception of material needs, a kind of egalitarianism predominates. It is important to underline this point because egalitarianism has no bitterer enemy than Marx himself. He holds that the concept of equality belongs to commodity production. In fact, commodity production is realized equality. Equality and inequality are reciprocally determined. Where there is equality, there is inequality and vice versa. Equality is a slogan and as a demand always remains within the horizon of bourgeois society. It abstracts from the uniqueness of the individual and quantifies what is qualitatively diverse. In the society that develops the wealth of individuality in communist society, equality is not realized. Equality and inequality as reciprocal determinations become meaningless and irrelevant. In order to demonstrate that this idea is constantly present in Marx's thought, I shall cite two passages, one from a work of his youth, the other from a late work in The Holy Family. Marx writes, Proudhon did not succeed in giving this thought the appropriate development. The idea of equal possession is a political economic one and therefore itself still an alienated expression for the principle that the object as being for man, as the objectified being of man, is at the same time the existence of man for other men, this human relation to other men, the social relation of man to man. 
The idea of equal possession, therefore, articulates in an alienated manner, i.e. within the horizon of bourgeois society and with its terminology, the real aim, which is to overcome the alienated relations. In the critique of the Gotha program, Marx does not attack the concept of equal possession, but that of equal right. Equal right, as we know, will continue to subsist in the first phase of communism, which therefore will still be a bourgeois society in this respect. This equal right is therefore a right to inequality in its content like every right. This equality is abstraction because it takes account of man only as worker. At the same time, it abstracts from the effective needs of individuals by furnishing them with equal amounts of goods from the social wealth according, according equal amounts of labor, whatever their needs actually are. Distribution according to needs, in contrast to distribution according to labor, overcomes both this equality and this inequality. According to the critique of the Gother program, as we know, no value exists in the second phase of communism, and labor is not reduced to simple labor. At the same time, Marx posits an extraordinary wealth of goods. Precisely for this reason, there is no place for what we have called the, egal the egalitarian aspect of communism. This is not the case in capital, where we come across a saturation model regarding material goods. In Marx's conception, this kind of egalitarian, egalitarianism is in no way identical with the equality of commodity production, equality of possession, and of rights. The matter at issue is rather the relative equality of actual needs as regards material goods. These, as we know, are only limited by other higher needs of individuals. We ourselves cannot imagine any social order in which the need for material goods can become saturated relatively easily, and where the individuality of needs develops exclusively through non-material needs. Today, we would call the conception which appears in capital egalitarian. However, the fact is that it was not an egalitarian one in Marx's size, and that he associated this model not with equality, but with a complete restructuring of the system of needs. The great importance that Marx attached to the restructuring of the system of need of needs also appears clearly in two observations in the Grand Race. In his maturity, Marx considered such a restructuring to be a sine qua non. On this point, there is no difference between capital and the Grand Race. <coughs> he writes about workers in capitalism as follows. Through excessive exhaustion of their powers brought about by lengthy, drawn-out, monotonous occupations, they are seduced into habits of intemperance and made unfit for thinking or reflection. They can have no physical, intellectual, or moral amusements other than of the, wor of the worst sort. The intemperance follows from the fact that no capacity for physical, intellectual, and moral amusements can develop in this worker. In the society of associated producers, in which this capacity, qualitative needs, is well developed, intemperance ceases. In another passage, Marx expounds the problems or the problem with reference to the social whole. If society has attained a certain level of material wealth, then society is able to wait. A large part of the wealth already created can be withdrawn both from immediate consumption and from production for immediate consumption. Let me repeat once again, for material needs, Marx is using something quite close to a saturation model at least when he analyzes the period after the attainment of a certain level of material wealth. At this point, the following question arises. Who makes the decisions about how productive capacity should be allocated? Who decides, for example, how long the production of goods directly serve, serving consumption can wait? Marx's reply, of course, is everyone. This is precisely why he speaks of associated individuals. But how can every individual make such decisions? Marx did, Marx did not answer this question, because for him it did not arise. For us, however, in our times, it has become perhaps the most decisive question of all. The focal point of contemporary Marxism is to work out models for this, or at least it ought to be. Naturally, it is no accident that Marx did not even once formulate the question about how every individual can take part in, de in decision making. We have already noted that in his opinion, the category of interests will be irrelevant in the society of the future, and that there will therefore be no group interests, nor conflict of interests. 
the clear common interest of every member of society apart from the satisfaction of necessary needs, which as we have seen still play a subordinate role in the structure of needs, will be the reduction of labour time. This is possible only through the maximum of rationalization. Consequently, every individual strives for the same thing, namely this maximum of rationalism. And the manner in which decision-making is carried on is of no consequence whatever. Whether the decisions are made by means of a referendum or through rotating representatives, every individual expresses the needs of all other individuals and it cannot be otherwise. In socialized man, the human species and the individual represent a realized unity. Every individual represents the species and the species is represented in every individual. The needs of socialized human beings determine production, and this means that the human species itself makes the decisions. To put it in Hegelian terms, in Marxist society of associated producers, the, the sphere of the objective spirit goes up in smoke. We find no system of right, no institution or politics there. What remains of the sphere of the objective spirit of class society is elevated to the sphere of the absolute spirit. For it is not only the pre-existing activities and objectivations in an alienated form of class society, such as art or philosophy, which are in conformity with the species for itself. Morals too, and every human relationship become in conformity with the species for itself. To continue with the Hegelian analogy, the world spirit is not only recognized in art and philosophy, but in every human relationship. Every individual is representative of a conformity to the species that has become real and actual. He recognizes this representativeness in every other person and presents himself as such in relation to them. All this is very well expressed in the Holy Family, where Marx speaks of morality in the future. Plato admitted that the law must be one-sided and must make abstraction of the individual. On the other hand, under human conditions, punishment will really be nothing but the sentence passed by the culprit on himself. There will be no attempt to persuade him that violence from without exerted by others is violence exerted on himself by himself. On the contrary, he will see in other people his natural saviors from the sentence which he has pronounced on himself. In other words, the relation will be reversed. In one of Kant's hypotheses, he imagined the ideal society to be that in which people make a contract to proceed according to the categoric imperative. From the point of view of his own philosophy, this is, in effect, a contradiction. If it is a case of making a contract, morality is changed into legality. In Marx's eyes, the same model, at least from the philosophical standpoint, appears to be posed without any contradiction. It if, if every individual represents conformity with the species for itself, then the need of every individual, in this case moral need, is involved at the level of this conformity. If his own particularity transgresses this conformity, he may therefore punish himself. The conflict between morality and legality is thus surmounted, since the opposition of opposed being between morality and legality, which for Marx is found only in class society and alienation, disappears. The disappearance of legality and of all institutions does not, of course, imply the simple disappearance of objectivation. Quite the opposite. Only in communism, in the positive abolition of private property, is individual possession properly founded. Remember, needs are always directed towards objects. These objectivations are all for themselves, except the sphere of production, which is in and for itself. Since we can no longer speak of material needs, but only of needs which stand outside them, every objectivation belongs to the realm of the absolute spirit. Non-material needs are therefore all directed to the absolute spirit, to their objectivations, to their objects, and to the allocation of these objects. Oh, what a drag. It is precisely for this reason that in the society of associated producers, the need for free time, for leisure time, has such a leading role in man's system of needs. Um, I lost myself. Leisure time is not necessarily synonymous with free time. The latter can, in fact, be interpreted as a negative concept, as freedom from labor. For Marx, however, free time is leisure time, an unambiguously positive category. 
time for genuinely human high-level activities, free activities. Furthermore, artistic activity has a leading role in free time activities as the work of Marx's most creative periods clearly demonstrates. Artistic activity, which even in the era of class society is already drawn towards objectivations for themselves and creates them, is the simplest and most illuminating example of what preoccupies Marx, the need for objectivations which are objectivations for themselves and which conform to the species, is the true human need of the members of the Society of Associated Producers. Needs for objectivations and objects for themselves are purely qualitative needs which are not quantifiable. Furthermore, they are always needs to, always needs to an end. Okay. This formulated in the third volume of Capital as follows. Beyond production begins the development of human energy, which is an end in itself, the true realm of freedom. And activities which are directed towards objectivations for themselves, the true wealth of human beings develops. A universality of needs and capacities that satisfies qualitatively different, non-quantifiable needs. Wealth is disposable time and nothing more. I said this like eight million times. The object for itself of needs can, as we have already noted, be not only an objectivation, but also the other person. Recall the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844 and his human relationships, socialized man at all times makes qualities possible only for other men, and this is an end in itself. Rich man is man rich in human relationships. The question here is, does need for human beings also mean need for community? The question is of is of significance not only for the system of needs, but also for the whole social model. We have seen that in Marx's notion of the society of associated producers, there is no place for the objective spirit, for the system of institutions. But should this also imply that there is no place for human integration? For Marx, community, even on the smallest, smallest scale, is justifiable and relevant only when it appears as the immediate form of conformity to the species for itself, when it is an objectivation that conforms with the species for itself. There is no interest and no conflict of interests. Community, like the individual, can only be an immediate expression of such conformity to the species. In the young Marx, community and the need for community undoubtedly appear as a late motif. Remember his thoughts on the meetings of communist workers. But at the same time, as a result of this association, they acquire a new need and the need for society and what appears as a means becomes an end. In the same work, he also says, although communal activity and communal enjoyment, i.e. activity and enjoyment, which are manifested and directly revealed in real association with other men will occur wherever such a direct expression of sociability stems from the true character of the activity's content and is adequate to its nature. Or again, in the same way, the senses and enjoyment of other men have become my own appropriation. Besides these direct organs, therefore, social organs develop in the form of society. Thus, for instance, activity and direct association with others, etc., has become an organ for expressing my own life and a mode of appropriating human life. Universal consciousness, reflection, philosophy, theory, and thought must be rooted in this communal being and not grip the masses merely after the event. My general consciousness is only the theoretical shape of that which the living shape is the real community, the social fabric. Although at the present time, general consciousness is an abstraction from real life and as such confronts it with hostility. This is why I started earlier that in Marx's view, not all, sorry, this is why I stated earlier that in Marx's view, not all philosophy will cease under communism, but only the philosophy which counterposes the particular to that which conforms with the species and which counterposes appearance to essence, the philosophy built on self-realizing values. It is social science instead, which according to this conception would seem to cease. In fact, there will no longer be any fetishism. In society, essence and appearance will overlap. And so social science, which owes its existence to the contradiction between essence and appearance, will in effect be superfluous under communism, according to Marx's view. The idea of community and of the need for society, which is properly central in the works of his youth, moves somewhat into the background in his later works. We can see various reasons for this. First, there is his critique of the community of natural societies and its limitedness. 
Wherever Marx speaks of community, even in his earlier works, he is thinking of something different from natural communities. He conceives the communities of the future as freely chosen, as made up of individuals who freely unite as purely social relations, a consequence of the pushing back of natural limits. However, as Marx devotes himself with increasing intensity to his analysis of the evolution of capitalism as alienated evolution, he puts increasing emphasis on the positive trend which capitalism has produced, amongst other things, by dissolving the natural communities. But there is another factor to be taken into account, that the presence of communities in the future society seems so obvious to Marx that he did not see any necessity for discussing it separately. Very often he speaks of the society of the future as the society of cooperatives. The existence of the community and the need for community, in effect, pass into the background, and in the few passages where he speaks of them, they appear as a natural perspective. This is how he deals with it in the third volume of Capital, for example. Analyzing the embryos of the future which exist in the present, he speaks of Robert Owen's cooperative factories. The cooperative factories of the laborers themselves represent within the old form the first shoots of the new. The capitalist stock companies, as much as the cooperative factories, should be considered as transitional forms from the capitalist mode of production to the associated one but the only distinction that the antagonism is resolved negatively in the one and positively in the other. In the draft of a letter to Vera Zaslik, written in 1881, Marx expresses himself in a still more broad and, and unambiguous manner. The Russian rural community finds capitalism in a crisis that will end only with its elimination and with the return of the modern societies to the archaic type of communal property, or as an American author has said, the new system to which modern society is tending will be a revival in a superior form of an archaic social type. There's no need to be frightened of the expression archaic. Furthermore, in discussing those aspects of the communities of the future, which will be different from the archaic communities, he points before all else to the fact that the former will not be based upon blood ties. This conception is in no way different from the position taken by Engels in his article of 1845. Description of the communist colonies that have originated in recent times and are still existing, in which he refers enthusiastically to the religious communes of the United States and predicts that they will spread. Marx was alarmed by the dissolution of the existing communities because he recognized and treasure, treasured them as embryos of the form of intercourse and integration, which is which in communism would become general. In Marx's view, therefore, the everyday life of man in the future society is not built around productive labor. On the contrary, productive labor occupies a subordinate position in the activities of everyday life. The center of organization of life is represented by those activities and human relationships which conform with the species for itself. The needs directed towards these qualitative needs as ends will become man's primary needs. They will constitute his unique individuality and will limit needs for material goods. It is in this way that the personality that is deep and rich in needs will be constituted. Marx believed this change in the structure of needs to be natural and obvious. He took so little account of the possibility of conflicts that one thing must be repeated. Although the change in being is the decisive issue for him, there are quite a few enlightenment aspects to be found in his conception. One will search in vain for the actual conflicts and problems of the transition which are so relevant for us and which are now a century old. But even so, this pure model has not lost its decisive significance for us. Engels spoke with pride of the development of socialism from utopia to science. Today, science contains more than a few utopian elements. But as Ernst Bloch has so strikingly said, there are fertile and infertile utopias. There are many respects in which Marx's ideas on the society of associated producers and on the system of needs of united individuals are utopian. When measured against our own today and our own possibilities for action, they are nonetheless fertile. He establishes a norm against which we can measure the reality and value, our, uh, and value of our ideas and with which we can determine the limitedness of our actions. It expresses the most beautiful aspiration of mature humanity, an aspiration that belongs to our being.